G'day, my name's Mick Petter. Um, I'm an environmental activist from Queensland. I've spent the last 22 years working as a volunteer in community-based catchment management, natural resource management, local ecology action groups and the like. Currently I'm coordinator of the Brisbane Region Environment Council, a chair of the Belimba Creek Catchment Coordinating Committee, immediate past chair of the South East Queensland Natural Resource Strategy Group and currently for the last six months I've been on a Land and Water Australia Community Fellowship in recognition of my 22 years experience in community catchment organising. And basically what I really want to talk about today is the fundamental importance of understanding how our water catchments work in the Australian context. Australia is one of the flattest, driest and definitely most infertile places on the planet. There's only one other continent on the entire planet that's drier than Australia and that's Antarctica because it doesn't get any rain. So in the Australian context, we also have to be aware that where we are now is the wettest period in Australian history for the last 45,000 years. For the last 15,000 years since the end of the glacial cycle, we've been in our wet phase. So what we know as a land of flooding rains, droughts and bushfires is actually as wet as it's been in some of the parts of the East Coast than it has been for a very long period of time. And it's fundamental that we understand exactly how those water systems work because we don't have a lot of water to work with. We only have a very small natural wage of water to work with here in Australia. We're confronted by very short, fast-flowing catchments here on the east coast by virtue of the slumped landscape and the flooded seashore we have when the sea level came up at the end of the last ice age. So we have very fast-flowing catchments that don't hold water for very long periods and tend to just dump them when you really don't need them. So for our society to evolve here in the Australian context and actually be sustainable, we've got to have a fundamental understanding of how those water catchments work. It's important to understand that not only for the management of water but also for the management of a wide range of other ecological processes which life fundamentally depends on. Water is the major medium by which most materials and nutrients are distributed throughout the ecosystem. The water catchment is therefore the fundamental unit of ecology because all animals and plants live within those catchments and rely on those flows of materials and nutrients carried by the water in order to survive as well as using the water itself. It is a feedback process because the life itself then affects the sort of water, the quality, quantity and timing of that water that comes out of that catchment. So the living systems and the water cycle are in a co-evolving system that operates for their own seemingly mutual benefit. The water doesn't care but life changes conditions to make it more favourable for life. So we've got to have this fundamental understanding of both the fundamental unit of ecology and how the water cycle works in order to put our society on a sustainable footing. Currently the scale and nature of the impacts we're having on our water catchments is such that we are drastically reducing their flows, we're changing the properties of the streams and we are degrading the water quality. We're also degrading the quality of that water habitat for all animals that need that water. So we're having an impact. Our per capita usage of water is one of the highest in the world. Currently most urban dwellers use about 750 litres per person per day in order to survive. Uh, I think a reasonable estimate could be about 50 to 60 litres is what's actually required. A lot of our water is wasted in inefficient leaky distribution systems so that we don't actually make more efficient use of the water resources we have and therefore we suffer in times of drought. Even more importantly, the animals and plants that don't get any benefits from our act economic activities suffer even more as we alter those catchments. So it's a problem that you can't just throw money at. It's not a problem that you can pass a law and fix. It's something within the power of every individual person because every individual person in their daily life and their home life has an impact on their local catchment and it's the net result of those choices that has the impacts on our catchments. So it's an exercise that we have to understand our way through. We have to understand our way through both at a societal level, a community level, an individual level, a government and an organisational level. Currently we're confronted by a large number of people in the community who are unaware of their water catchments, unaware of basic catchment hydrology, unaware of what impacts they're having on their particular catchments and very unaware about what's actually happening in terms of the loss of the biodiversity and those long-term nutrient cycles that we're dealing with. So it's an understanding problem and part of what I've been doing for the last 22 years is doing what I call growing sense of place, which is giving people the tools and the eyes and the different skills they need to be able to see that landscape for what it is, to be able to see their catchment, 
to be able to be aware of those ecological processes, to be able to be aware of those lifestyle decisions and what they're doing to when and where they are. So a lot of the work I have to do is increasing people's awareness of what is actually going on in the landscape around them. So bureaucratically that's pretty obvious. I mean we have large-scale uh, government departments whose job and for a long period of time like in Queensland they said that demand equals allocation and we've had them build dams and allocate 121 percent of the water available in that dams. We've had them look at the flows going down in the Murray-Darling system and say oh my god 70 percent of this water is going out of the state let's stop half of it in order to achieve short-term economic objectives. So what we're confronted with is a fundamental misunderstanding of what's going on we have various catchment managers responsible for catchment management but the one question I like to ask them to see whether or not they really understand about catchments which I'll talk about a little bit more the fundamentals of how catchments work is where does the river the water in the river come from when it's not raining if it's not raining anywhere in your water catchment which is the highest piece of ground you can see your catchment is always as far as you can see is marks your catchment both in the short scale and storm soil. So where does that where does that water in the river come from in your catchment even if there's no rain? And this is where we have to understand it. Most water managers who monitor water quality in the stream can't answer that question where that water comes from. But it comes from the natural ecological process. It comes from a fundamental understanding of the water cycle that when the rain falls a certain compartment of it if it doesn't run off if it's trapped by vegetation it will infiltrate into the water table and it will flow slower down into the creek so you have less fast behaving creeks it slows down the response to the rain it soaks up the rain it delays it it stops it getting fast and taking a lot of soil it then filters it through those natural biological materials to improve its water quality and to strip uh, unwanted things out of it such as uh, things that can cause acidity and then it flows into the creek now during the flood it also comes down it fills up the floodplain and it uses the whole floodplain as a giant underground dam and during the flood times and the wet times it fills all those sand masses and all that soil up with water and then when the water pressure in the creek subsides all that water will start to flow out slowly and that's what contributes the major base flow to creeks when it's not raining so that's the answer to the question most of the water fresh water in the landscape is in the soil something like 40 times the amount of water in the soil than there is in all the rivers and lakes put together and that's something very important because most water quality strategies do not address soil water quality and do not address groundwater quality issues which means we're only addressing the symptom of the problem the river is the product of the catchment not the other way around so by only focusing on the in-stream water quality and beside the stream riparian restoration we're only dealing with a very small part of the total water cycle that we actually need to manage for the catchments. A proper catchment management approach starts at the ridges and works down and from the riparian corridors and works up and has a fundamental understanding that a majority of the water we're working with is in the soil and it's vital to keep their native vegetation in that system in order to maintain that water table balance that was there. We know in Australia that if you remove vegetation you can permanently lower water tables in some areas and raise them downstream where you don't want them raised where it then expresses a salinity. So we know that the trees have a very fundamental role and powerful role in the ecology of catchments here in Australia. They still have a very powerful role even in the more wetter environments of Europe. Studies done in, as early as the 1960s in the, in the US demonstrated that when you clear fell catchments you fundamentally change the catchment, you change the water regime, you end up with peaky flash floods full of sediment and also because the trees aren't there to absorb the hydrogen that comes from the, the rainwater that falls, that hydrogen acidifies the soil and strips all the nutrients out of it. If the trees and the natural vegetation and humus layer were there, that would be added to the nitrogen produced by the plants and turned into ammonia, which then leads to more plant growth in, an, in a soluble form. So. Um, we know that there's this fundamental interconnection between the water catchments and the nature conservation, the biodiversity, the vegetation and the animals and plants that are needed to maintain those vegetation communities as a whole functioning ecological unit. Now if we disturb those processes, sure we can get some short term benefits, we get pasture, we get things like that, but overall the nutrient balance of the, of the, of the landscape is running down, overall it is less effective at capturing moisture. It is less effective at, at recycling that moisture. Most mature forests generate something like 30 to 40% of their own rain just from the amount of water vapour coming out of the plants. 
it gets more so in some of the tropical areas, but in the Australian context, that's about what all we can do because 60% of our evaporated rain will be taken away because of the latitudes our continent is in. This is what I mean about understanding our context. You can't manage water quality here on the Victoria Creek unless you understand those big earth patterns that are going on that are actually affecting the weather here and make sure that any unit of fog that evaporates off this ground, 60% of it will never touch this continent again. You, people need to know that in order to manage their catchments. So there's this fundamental interconnection between the vegetation, the water quality, the water quantity, the timing of the flows, and the maintenance of the streams in, in their sort of natural format that, that were here before Europeans, which means they were slower moving, they had more water holes, snags, billabongs, habitat opportunities for native fish. They didn't carry as much sediment, but they still carried their natural wage and other materials that needed to flow naturally out to sea, like the sand and the humus and the forest products that, that the, the marine ecosystems rely on for their nourishment, which then underpin the whole fisheries, which are a very important food resource for even contemporary Australians and we rely heavily on them. So there's this other interconnections between not just the water quality and quantity, but what that water is capable of doing, both for good and for bad. We have changed, so we've made more peaky streams with no billabongs, no anabranches, no habitat opportunities, no snags, that doesn't slow the water down, that runs it out to sea quickly, that evaporates it quickly and then doesn't soak it up. And so consequently we have a number of catchment management problems. We have losses of soil fertility. We have decreases in water quality. We have decreases in water quantity. And the, and the very nature of the water doesn't carry the nutrients we need to sustain the coastal fisheries. And that and the impact of over extensive trawling is what's helping lead to the collapse of some of these coastal ecosystems as well as some of the other the sort of bad things we're doing to the fish species by taking out their old fish. So everything sort of revolves around that. So what we do in the upper catchment with a forest coop can have a profound effect on the livelihood of coastal fishing communities through no obvious connection but through just a chain of physical events that are driven by physics. This is stuff that's not amenable to just changing by government policy. They can't change the law of physics by government policy. If you do this, that will happen. And we as catchment managers need to know that. But it's not just up to those governments. So having looked at some of those fundamentals, like that there's 40 times the amount of water in the soil, the other thing we need to realise as catchment management, before going on to talk about how to do this, is that it's not just the rivers and creeks where the water comes out of. Here on our coast, we need to understand that we are living in water world. 16,000 years ago, the sea levels came up 120 metres. All land that was previously inhabited by the Aboriginal people at that time, they lived a majority on the coast just as we live a majority on the coast. Those lands were flooded. If you talk to those traditional owners, they can describe those landscapes to you. But that has flooded our coastline, pushed the ocean right into the bays. We've got all these marvellous bays. But why do we get all these lakes up the coast? You know, why doesn't all the water come out the rivers? Well, what they've discovered is that 20 times the amount of water that comes out of the rivers actually comes straight out of the coastline. And what we're getting with all these dams, all, all these natural lakes, is the ocean is acting as a dam. So all this water is moving through the soil, not in the creek, not in the river, in the soil, in the water table, and it hits the sea and it dams up and you get all these nice freshwater lakes sitting behind the sea, which was just perfect from the Aboriginal permaculture situation, but you need to understand the why of the landscape in order to be able to manage it. So we need to be aware of the water quality and quantity of these submarine flows as well in order to do catchment management. So how do we do this? Well, it, as I said, it's not a matter of legislation. Legislation is a necessary requirement. Changes in business practices are a necessary requirement. But what drives it is an individual understanding by groups, individuals and communities that that is what is required to be done. Because the government can't look over everyone's shoulder all the time. Land management relies on people actively being involved with it, which means they need to actively understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, the importance of doing it, and that will then motivate action that can happen independent of whether or not Big Brother's looking over their shoulder with a big stick to find them if they don't do the right thing. That's the end result of a cultural change. Catchments are managed when they become self-aware. And what I do in catchment organising is try and imbue that local community with the understanding and knowledge to help manage their catchment so that catchment becomes a living, self-aware entity with the humans integrated into the ecology functioning together to work towards sustainable objectives and for the benefit of the nature as well as the humans. And so that's 
That's what we have to do. And we use the catchment then as a cross-party political. It ignores political lines, it ignores racial divides. Everyone has to live in a catchment. Everyone understands their catchment. Through sharing their understanding of the catchment, that builds a sense of community, a sense of identity, which leads to a sense of meaning and self-fulfillment and a likelihood of greater local action and a greater meaning to life. So through using the catchment as a place-based organising tool, we can actually build social cohesion and build that learning element that the catchment needs in order to undo the damage that we've done. And when we're finished fixing the catchment in order to keep managing that catchment into the future so it keeps serving our needs for both water quality, biodiversity, nature conservation, spiritual values and all those other factors. Uh, what would you suggest that people can do individually, you know, like small landowners or, or people just in you know, normal domestic situations? Well, rain falls on every yard. What you do with your rainwater is the most primary fundamental decision you have to do. Are you going to dump it off your roof into a concrete pipe so that it doesn't go through the soil, it doesn't get clean and it, it arrives in the creek in about 10 seconds after it's fallen on your roof? I don't think that's a good thing. I think we should reuse our roof runoff for at least garden watering. I think not so much, I don't advocate first flush systems. First flush systems are actually dangerous because what they make sure is that the first most dirtiest water goes into the local creek and the rest goes into your tank. I prefer to see a system of two water tanks where the rain comes off the roof, settles in one and flows to the other. That's the most healthy option in terms of environmental management of any contaminants that might fall on your roof, pathogens, car, fallout, you know, all that sort of stuff. It settles in the bottom of your tank, you can deal it with it there, you still get the clean water in the second tank but the impacts don't go off site. So that's just what we do with our roof. Then we've got our yards. Of that 750 litres per day per person that we use of clean, fresh, potable drinking water, 40% of that will go on lawns and gardens. So we don't need to use that amount of water. If you do catch drains across your yard, you can capture most of the rain that falls on your yard and have it infiltrate into your soil where it is safely stored in an underground dam where it won't be evaporated to be used by your trees and plants. If you adopt the watering strategy of deeply watering your plants rather than just daily watering, you just do it once a week but you do it fairly deeply, it teaches the plant roots to go down looking for water. If you water every day with just a shallow sprinkle, it grows lots of surface roots. If it just grows lots of surface roots, when it dries out it goes brown. If you water it infrequently but deeply, you get deeper roots, which means they're more resistant to dry spells. So you, you organise the runoff from your yard so you deal with your runoff. You try and infiltrate as much of it as possible. You run it through grassy filter strips to make sure it's not carrying any contaminants. You then channel that runoff into your tree holes. You look at it though like that. Uh, you then select plants and, and other species that are low in water consumption or that are very good at finding their own local water. That means probably native species or sometimes some introduced species if they're particularly good at that. And so you design into your whole garden, that's just your roof in your garden, uh, a water management scheme that says, I'm aware that if I don't do this, my water will run off in a very dirty state into the concrete drain, down into a concrete pipe and straight into the creek carrying all those sediments. Whereas if I do this, I know it will eventually seep out down into the lower part of the catchment clean and fresh, I'll have used it as efficiently as possible, kept it on my property for as long as possible, but then it's still clean, fresh condition, passed on downstream to the next area that has to use and relies on that water to keep flowing. Inside the house, you can then look at all your different water appliances and make sure that you get a front-loading washing machine rather than a top-loading washing machine. That's the other thing they can do is get out and know their catchment. Walk along your local ridges, find out what your local creek is. Does it have a name? Does it have a history? What is its name? Where does it start? Where does it go to? Have you followed its ridge? Do you know the animals and plants in it? Do you know what's supposed to be in the stream when you look in there? Do you know what native fish is supposed to be there? These are all things individuals can do and need to know and there's great benefit in knowing them. It's, it's a very uplifting experience to know that, to actually what I say is most people walk around in a grey and a green blur. They walk around not knowing when or where they are. They walk around not knowing what plants and animals they're looking at. They just know it's a tree but they don't know what species of tree it is. So what we try and do and what individuals can do is know your catchment. That way you can walk around and you know that that house was built in 1830 and it was part of the original selectors but before that it was Ewan country and that this creek rises at the holy mountain of Gulliger and goes down to the lake and the landscape starts to have meaning as you walk through it. 
That's not just a tree, but that's our locally important river gum and it's vital habitat for the glossy black cockatoos. And so the, the landscape starts getting richer and richer. The more you walk through it, the more you can see, the more you start to see. The more you start to see, the more you can see and it builds on it. So you just start getting this mind expansion from just walking around your local landscape. So that's another thing the individuals can do. Get out and know your catchment. Find out how it works. Know the names of the animals. Know the names of the plants. Know the names of your traditional owners. Find out what your local creek is. Where does it start? Where does it finish? What are the fish in it? It's all worth knowing. That and all the other stuff they can do in their household to save water as well. But it's not just water saving. It's understanding water cycle.